you are asking. Some, some kind of misunderstanding about the place for this seminar. So we are happy to, to host today uh, Gael Giraud. Uh, Gael Giraud is, uh, has many, many facets. He's, a, he's an economist, he's a senior researcher at CNRS. He's also leading a, a center on environmental issues at Georgetown University. Uh, and uh, he is also a priest, and there is some link between, between his economic activity uh, and this. And you may probably tell about that. And he will talk about complexity macroeconomics and, uh, and what? And climate. And climate. Environment. Environment. <laughs> because he is the one who set up the team that you know from the French Agency of Development. Antoine and these people, it is Gaël who attracted them to. Uh, he led them to, to start a model in continuous time. And by the way, Antoine convinced me uh, to change to continuous time. <laughs> two, two years. The floor is yours for 45 Thanks. minutes. Okay, we good. We can keep discussion. Okay. The discussion will be uh, short, 15 minutes, not more. And then we'll have the discussion with you. Okay, so thank you for the, uh, the invitation. Is there anything for me to change? Or I can do it this way. So what I'm going to present to you is a kind of it's a scientific program <coughs> which tries to do several things at the same time. <coughs> One which is to combine macroeconomics with climate and natural resources. And the other one, but this is the same issue actually, to rewrite macroeconomics. <coughs> Why? Because if you think about it, you know, neoclassical macroeconomics is essentially rooted in uh, general equilibrium theory. Maybe you know a little bit of GET, general equilibrium theory. As you know, general equilibrium theory relies on the assumption that everything takes place at equilibrium. So it's a purely static viewpoint <coughs> of the universe, which postulates that at the beginning we were at equilibrium, we are at equilibrium, and we will always stay at equilibrium, no matter what. Now, if you try to combine this viewpoint with climate, in the way scientists understand climate and environment, you see that there is a big, big gap. Why? Because climate science, as every science except uh, economics, is based on a nonlinear dynamical system, making the assumption that <coughs> climate, <coughs> I have no voice, I'm sorry, making the assumption that climate evolves according to some nonlinear differential equation that you can write, study, simulate, etc., etc. Biology does the same, <coughs> chemistry, physics, climate science, everything. There is one exception in sciences where people don't use these kind of tools, which is economics, because our best friends, you know, neoclassical economists, believe that everything from the beginning and forever takes place at equilibrium. So if we want to combine climate and economics, we definitely need to rewrite macroeconomics. What do, what do I mean when I say we want to combine climate and macroeconomics? <coughs> We want to do <coughs> something which is never done at the IPCC, if you know a little bit the IPCC reports. What people do in IPCC reports or in the papers which are quoted by the IPCC team is that they say, suppose that we have this trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions, which is exogenously given, then if we follow this trajectory, then these will be the consequences in terms of heat, humidity, rainfalls, etc etc but of course nobody knows whether we are going to follow <coughs> this trajectory or another one and as you know <coughs> now we believe that we are following more or less RCP 4.5 which is one of the main scenarios of uh, of the IPCC team but nobody knows and especially if you want to address the question what about if we were let's say in Europe or in the US or in Japan or in China to implement a very high carbon tax, this would presumably reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> but this would also have a huge impact in terms of public debt, unemployment, growth, etc. But you don't know actually this because in the IPCC reports, you take as given the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions once for all. So in other words, you cannot endogenize the greenhouse gas emission trajectory with respect to the economic engine at the world, in the world economy. So what we want to do is to proceed with this endogenization process in order to be able to study some scenarios like 
what would happen if the Biden administration were to put into practice a huge carbon tax, which they refuse to do, uh, in terms both of the balance trade of the U.S., greenhouse gas emissions, uh, big typhoons, you know, in Louisiana, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for that purpose, as I said, we need to rewrite microeconomic theory because we cannot just try to couple a purely static equilibrium-based model with a nonlinear dynamical system. So for that purpose, the main idea is to say we have to rewrite macro as a nonlinear dynamical system. How can I go here like this? Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip this because I don't have time enough. So maybe, so what I wanted to say here earlier, sorry, here is that you are probably aware of the very famous uh, talk given by Mark Carney, who was then the governor of the Bank of England in September 2015 in front of the Lloyds, you know, the big bank, the British bank, where he said the main threat of financial stability today is climate. And there are three main risks. One, which is the physical risk, that is the destruction of infra infrastructures, capital, GDP, by climate extreme events, by floods, by you know, droughts, etc., etc. <coughs> That's capital, the, the physical risk. The second risk is the transition risk, which means that if we go fast towards the decarboniz decarbonization of our economy, then there are a number of institu uh, financial institutions which most probably are going to be bankrupt. And the third threat or the third risk that he mentioned back then was the legal risk. Uh, in so far, there might be NGOs or you know, groups of citizens uh, which are going to complain against their own states or their own big companies because they do nothing in order to at least to be compliant with the Paris Agreement of 2015. So the physical risk is the first one. <coughs> so let's focus on this. And if we do want to deal with the physical risk, we have to face the fact that there is a stream <coughs> in the academic literature led by someone like Bill Nordhaus, you know, who got the Nobel Award, which keeps saying, well, you know, climate risk is not a big deal because the destruction induced by global warming will be non-negligible, but, you know, so, so small. And more specifically, he claims that if we get something like plus six degrees Celsius of temperature anomaly at the end of this century, which is just huge, then the impact will only be minus 10% of the world real GDP, which is, which is essentially ridiculous. If you talk with the climate scientists, they will just laugh and say, you guys, you are crazy. Plus six degrees is just the apocalypse on Earth. And Bill Nordhaus goes even further than that. He says, well, you know, if you take, you make some, you run some cost-benefit analysis in the good old neoclassical tradition, then you end up with the conclusion that the optimal global warming level is plus 3.5 degrees. Yes. So essentially he says, you know, we should not take care of the two degree threshold of the Paris Agreement because it's even better to get warmer. 3.5 is the optimal temperature, <laughs> which is just insane if you think about it. We know already the destructions induced by the current global warming and we are just below plus 1.5. I let you just imagine what's going to happen if we have plus 3.5, okay? So we have to deal with that. And <coughs> One of the main reasons for this uh, kind of blindness um, is that these economists never talk really with climate scientists. Because on the side of climate scientists, we ha you have a completely different picture. Now, there was a paper, which is mentioned here, publi published by the Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, the PNAS, uh, which says essentially, uh, now, as scientists, we can no longer avoid a discussion about the hypothesis of the extinction of humanity in the next century. Because the situation is so serious that we would not be responsible as scientists if we were to refuse to discuss this hypothesis. And to the best of my knowledge, it's the first time that in such a very prestigious scientific uh, journal, climate scientists dare to discuss this question, okay? So on the one hand, we have some neoclassical economists who keep repeating, you know, not a big deal. On the other hand, we have climate scientists who, who say we have to face the, uh, the possibility of the extinction of humanity in the 22nd century. <coughs> 
Very quickly, uh, I, I encourage you to look at what we have done at the so-called Institut Rousseau in French, the Rousseau Institute, which is a French think tank of which I'm the president, where we have published a report in March this year, a report that I think we are going to translate into English. So far, it's only in French, and I'm sorry for that, I apologize, <coughs> where we try to describe a decarbonization path for France from today to 2050, which lead to uh, the carbon, net carbon neutrality of the French economy in 2050. Net carbon neutrality means that there will still be some greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 we, if we follow this path, but these residual carbon emissions will be compensated by uh, an additional absorption, absorption of carbon by the French forests. <coughs> which, by the way, I open a parenthesis, requires us to take care of our forest, which we are not doing now. So, because if they all burn, meanwhile, you know, there won't be any well to absorb uh, green, uh, greenhouse gas in 2050, okay? So, if you are interested in, it's a, it's, you know, it's a work of a, a team, a bunch of very good, excellent French engineers. They have done a fantastic job. You have the full description of the scenario and how much it costs. And, and we are, I think, the first to have done it. Meanwhile, uh, South African economists have done the same job for South Africa. And paradoxically enough, they end up with the same conclusion, roughly speaking, which is that it costs, quote unquote, only 2% of the French GDP or the South African GDP every year from today to 2050. So 2%, you would say, well, that's a lot of money, which is true. But at the same time, that's affordable, which is true as well. We could spend that money just to save us. We have spent much more money to save the banks, much more money to save us during the, the lockdown because of the pandemic. So we can do it, actually. It's just a question of political will, a willingness to do it. OK? But that's just, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. It's not just, it's an it's a interesting job. But there is no macroeconomic model underlying this report. So we don't know the impact in terms of employment, balance of trade, public deficit, etc., of such a path. We have some conjectures, and we believe that this would create a lot of new green jobs. But in order to be sure of that, we would need to run a model. What kind of model? And this is where macroeconomics enter the picture, enters the picture. And there, we have to face the fact that macroeconomics is in crisis, at least since 2016. So there are a number of leading economists who have dared to publish papers saying, like uh, Paul Romer, who got the Nobel Award, you know, for more than three decades, I quote, macroeconomic has gone backwards. Uh, and at the end, he says something, yes, that um, a parallel with string theory from physics hints at a general failure mode of science that is triggered when respect for highly regarded leaders evolves into a defense to authority that displaces objective fact from its position as the ultimate determinant of scientific truth. So that's a very strong paper. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do it. And at the same time, 2016, there was also a paper published by Olivier Blanchard, the French economist who is now teaching at Harvard University, who back then was the chief economist of the uh, International Monetary Fund, the IMF, who says, all our DSGE models, I don't know whether this rings a bell to you, DSGE models, are essentially flawed. He writes that. The chief economist of the IMF. And at the same time, there is also a, a past, and sorry, and his paper was published as a report from the Peterson Institute, which is a very famous um, neoliberal think tank in, in Washington. Uh, essentially the analog of, in the US of the Bruegel Institute in Brussels in, in Europe. And at the same time, there was also a blog published by Narayana Kochalakota, who back then was the governor of the Central Bank of Minneapolis, Minnesota, who says, well, all our models are completely flawed, and it will not be enough to change one epsilon here or there to fix them. We have to rewrite everything from scratch. So part of the profession has understood, at least in 2016, that we are in a deep, epistemological crisis, and we definitely have to rewrite macroeconomics. So the, the, the solution I'm going to present to you, just to make you laugh a little bit, I presented it uh, to Paul Romer when he was the chief economist of the World Bank, and I was serving as the chief economist of the French Development Bank. 
where I recruited Antoine Godin, whom you know. And so I presented him what I'm going to present to you, <coughs> or you know, the, the preliminary version of that. And he said, yeah, that's very interesting, that's very clever. But you know, we cannot do this at the World Bank. This is too clever for us, <laughs> he said back then. Of course, it was a kind of provocation in front of the managers of his research team. And as you may know, he had to leave the World Bank a couple of months later. Um, he was essentially fired. But it says something about the way someone like Paul Romer would consider this. The starting point is to say, we no longer assume that everything takes place at equilibrium. Why? Because we know that this is not true in real life. But we know also that people are ready to adjust their behavior to consciously or not maybe reach an equilibrium in the long run. And this is essentially the topic of complexity economics. I'd, I'm not going to enter into the details of this. You, you have the very famous Santa Fe Institute in the US which deals with this kind of question. We are also doing our, our job in this direction. Just understand that the kind of dynamics I'm going to present to you does not assume that we are at equilibrium, but allows for the possibility that we can study trajectories of an economy which might ultimately lead to an equilibrium. So we are not anti-equilibrium. We just say, well, how do you know we are at equilibrium? And if we are not, what is the possible path that would lead to an equilibrium? You see the point? And maybe then it's not possible to reach an equilibrium. Maybe it is. And then let's study the, 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 the conditions under which it is. You know? The starting point is something you probably you know, because this is Godelet Lavoie who, who, uh, who did this job, is to say, since we are dealing with the dynamics, we have to be stock flow consistent. What it means is that at each point of time, all the stocks in the economy, like, for instance, the quantity of money you have in the, in the deposit account of households, or like the value of the capital of firms, or like another stock would be, yeah, here the quantity of debt, private debt of firms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these stocks have to be the outcome of the history of flows from the past. If this is not the case, it means that at a certain point of time in history, some flows disappeared or some stocks just emerged out of nowhere, which is just impossible. It's a bit like, you know, matter and energy consistency according to the first law of thermodynamics. It's the same idea. As simplistic as it might seem, this is far from being a completely trivial requirement. And if you think of DSG models or equilibrium models, like, you know, CGE, computable general equilibrium models, you will see that they are not compliant with this. Why? Because the assumption that everything takes place at equilibrium blurs completely this, the picture and there are a number of variables of which you cannot even say whether these are stocks or flows. One very simple example which is initial endowments in a so-called arrow de Bru economy, you know, in general equilibrium theory. I ask you, what do you think? Initial endowments, are these flows or stocks? Nobody knows. Why? Because at equilibrium, you cannot make the distinction between a flow and a stock. So now that we study out of equilibrium dynamics, we have to be stock flow consistent. And this essentially boils down to building the skeleton of the economy. So here it's very simple. You have only three types of actors. So households, firms, and banks. But of course, we have to add the public sector. We have to add the rest of the world. We also have to distinguish various sectors among firms and probably also various you know, social uh, categories or classes within households. Okay? So this is the very the simplest representation. Then once you have done this, what you do is you construct the dynamics by writing differential equations which describe the evolution across time of the flows. And since you are stock flow consistent, you know the outcome of this in terms of stock. Okay? So this is a very simple example also, which is not what we do, but that's the famous, you, I'm sure you have seen this already, the famous graph, the, simpl the simple version of World 3, which was the model used by the Meadows team for the report uh, limits to growth in 1972. Okay? So essentially it means that you have back loops, which are nonlinear, between all the various you know, entities of your model. So in our case, <coughs> For instance, you have a back loop between consumption of households, which are income for, uh, for firms, and, and wages. So wages are spent by firms to households. And the question is, how do households adjust their consumption according to wages? 
And then for that purpose, because this is going to move across time, you write down a differential equation which describes the evolution of both variables in terms of maybe one and each other or other variables. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. In other words, <coughs> one, you have written the skeleton of the economy, which is the, the social accounting matrix I just described earlier, the stock flow consistent matrix. Then you add flesh to your economy by writing these kind of back loops, essentially differential equations. Okay? Then the main building block of the kind of model that we study is to assume that there is something like a short run Phillips curve. What it says, and I'm sure you know it with the, the whole history of Phillips, who was an alligator hunter, I don't know whether you know that, in Australia. Um, the main idea is to say, if you have a lot of unemployment in an economy, it's very hard to bargain an increase of your wages. Okay? Whereas if you have full employment in the economy, it's, it's much more easy. It's much easier. No? So there is a negative relationship between the, the rate of unemployment and the speed at which you can bargain an increase of your monetary wage. This is the short-run Phillips curve. As you probably know, there is a huge literature de dedicated to this. A very important distinction is the long-run Phillips curve and the short-run Phillips curve. So many neoclassical economists would say there is no such thing as a Phillips curve because they think of the long-run Phillips curve, which is impossible in their view because in the long run we are at equilibrium. And the dilemma between inflation and employment, because if you have a Phillips curve, you have this dilemma. If you want a low unemployment rate, you have to allow for some inflation. If you want a low inflation rate, you have to allow for some unemployment. This cannot be the case at equilibrium for neoclassical economists. But my question here is not lo the long-run Phillips curve, but rather the short-run Phillips curve. And this is much more difficult to, to discuss uh, because empirically we have seen it. Now, it's true that today there is a dispute about the empirical existence of the short-run Phillips curve in a number of countries. But my answer to that is that this is due to the fact that there are a number of institutions, institutional revolutions which have taken place in the past three decades. Just one example, in Germany you have the Hartz Gesetz, the Hartz Laws, you know, in 2002, 2003, thanks to our good friend Gerhard Schröder, who was a good friend of all the workers in Germany, uh, and the outcome of this was the impossibility for German workers to bargain for an increase of the wages. And as you, s as you know, if you know a little bit Germany, since the Hartz reform, there is virtually no increase of wages of so little from 2003, let's say, to 2018, where Mutti Merkel, Angela Merkel, decided that this was too much and that we had to foster a little bit the demand of German households so that we had to allow uh, wages to increase again, then it's a completely political question. So of course, I mean, Angela Merkel is not in the model, Gerhard Schröder is not in the, mod in the model, etc., etc. So of course you could say, well, there is no such thing as the Phillips curve, and uh, my answer is yes, but in Germany from 2003 to 2018, just the Phillips curve is flat because of the political landscape of Germany, you know? Same question for a number of other countries for which at the end of the 90s, increase of wages have been very hard because of the competition of Chinese workers. Roughly speaking, at the end of the 90s, you have the globalization of the, of the world labor market, quote-unquote, because as you know, labor is not a private item, so there is no such thing as a labor market, but let's use this expression just for the ease of this, expo uh, of this uh, presentation. And then the, the consequence of that was a, a wage deflation imposed by the fact that you had many workers in China who were working for literally nothing, who were put in competition with a number of workers in Western countries or in Africa. So this does not mean that the Phillips curve disappeared, but it means sim simply that it became flat because of the entrance of Chinese workers on the global labor market. Does this make sense? So, um, the, the, so here you have a counter example where you see there is a very strong correlation between employment, which is the blue curve, and, and the, um, the average uh, wages in the US, which is the, 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 the green curve. So essentially, the starting point is a model that maybe you have heard of, which is uh, due to uh, Goodwin in the late 60s, which says, well, everything goes on as if there would be a kind of uh, you know, trade-off 
between employment and wages. And so, in other words, he uses a lot cavalry dynamics, which is a pre-predator dynamics that is widely used in biology to study the interaction between two species, like wolves and rabbits, for instance, where he says essentially the wolves, that's the wage, and the rabbits, that's employment <coughs> rate. Using this idea, you write a dynamical system, which is a two-dimensional dynamical system, very easy, very simple. The unique problem is that, so th the advantage of that is that this creates a business cycle, endogenous business cycle, thanks to this dynamical system, which as you may know, is very hard to obtain in an equilibrium model. Look at the RBC literature dedicated to CGEs. But the, the problem is that it's a, it's a conservative dynamical system in the sense that if you are not at equilibrium, because there is an equilibrium in the Goodwin model, then you just cycle along the same orbit forever, which is not what we observe. We do observe, empirically speaking, uh, cycles, but we don't observe that just, it's just a repetition of the same cycle years after years. So there is something else. This something else has been introduced later on <coughs> uh, in the 90s by, um, so let me skip this, by, uh, so sorry, just as an illustration, here you see the evolution of the wage share, that is the fraction of GDP which is dedicated to wages, which as, which as you know is declining f in the last three decades, no? but at the same time which do indeed exhibit a cycle, and this cycle is strongly correlated with the cycle of the employment rate. And that's exactly the idea of Goodwin, okay? So you have a kind of uh, interplay between employment and wages, and the idea is very simple. Suppose that output increases. If output increases, usually you have employment which increases. As you know, this is no, no longer always the case, but let's assume for simplicity that this is the case in the economy we are scrutinizing. So output increases, then therefore employment increases, you hire more people. If employment increases because of the Phillips curve, wages will increase more rapidly because it's easier for you to bargain and increase in your money wage. If wages increase more rapidly, then this means that the profit rate will, dec will decline, the share of GDP dedicated to profits. If the profit rate declines, then this means you have less incentive to invest as an entrepreneur. So you will tend to invest a little bit less, more slowly, etc. Then this means that GDP is going to uh, at least not to accelerate, and maybe even to decline. If this is so, then employment will reduce. If employment rank wrinkles, or if employment decline, uh, shrinks, then wages will stop accelerating because it will become much harder for you to, uh, to bargain an increase of your wages. If this is so, then the profit share will increase again, and if the profit share increases again, then investment can start again. So you see you have the complete cycle, which is just the interplay between wages and employment. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes? To Danny, yes, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> and what about the others? More or less? Am I, am I going too fast? No, it's okay? So you, you know all this. Oh, okay, good. So here you have an illustration. That's Goodwin, okay? It's just a cycle, and you cycle along the orbit. Here also you have an illustration which has been done by one of my PhD students, Florent Macuzac, who has proven something very interesting. So Florent now is working at the World Bank, uh, uh, you know, the small competitor of the French Development Bank. I'm kidding. Um, so what he has shown is that if you try to, to do some backtesting, uh, then <coughs> this kind of model, how simplistic it might seem, performs better than most of the neoclassical models and even the Danavar vector autoregressive model. What does it mean? When you do some backtesting, it means that you construct your model, you calibrate or you estimate the parameters of your model, let's say from 1950 to 1980. And then you run your model from 1980 to today or let's say to 2000. But the point is that you know what happened, but you do as if you wouldn't know you would be blind, you would be in 1980, and you would run your model and just, just run the model for the next 20 years. And then you compare the prediction of your model with, with, wha with what really happened meanwhile. This is called backtesting. If you do some backtesting with your neoclassical macroeconomic model, I can swear after two years it's completely wrong. So we use models at the ECB, the IMF, the World Bank, 
which are completely unable to predict anything that would make sense after two years. Okay? And for the first year, it's not too wrong because of the inertia of the economy. And that's why the VAR works so well for the first year, because the VAR model is just the linear uh, extension you know, of, what hap of the trend that you have observed historically in the past few years. And it's true that except if you have a war in Ukraine or the subprime crisis, it's true that the inertia of the economy is such that during one year, more or less, you can observe only the linear extension of the trends. But after one year, the non-linearity of the economy gains, again, matters much more, and then you definitely need to have a non-linear dynamical system. And it happens that even the Goodwin model, how simplistic it might seem to be, performs better at six months, one year, two years, ten years, than every neoclassical model, and even than the VAR, okay? Which, even for me, was very surprising. Uh, so yeah, that's the result by, by flow. Then, of course, you will say, well, two dimensions is very simple. You cannot hope to capture all the phenomena of an economy with a two-dimensional dynamical system. Just impossible. Don't dream of that. You have to add more flesh to your model, to the skeleton, remember? And this was done by a friend of, of mine, but you, which is who, who you also know, I guess, Steve Keen in the 90s, who introduced private debt. Not public debt, which is not a big deal, as you know, but private debt, which is much more serious than, than public debt. So he said essentially, you know, it may be the case that your investment, which is this, is higher than your profit, which is this. In this case, what ca how can a firm fund their investment? They just have to borrow money from the banking system or on financial markets, which means then, then they are entering into debt, so debt increases in order to fund their investment. Okay? And then you add a third dimension, a third dynamical system, a third differential equation, which is the motion or the kinetics of debt, private debt, of firms. And if you do this, you enter into a new world where you still have cycles, you still have cycles, but you, no longer, you are no longer in a conservative model, but in a dissipative one where you may have equilibria. So here it's an example, three-dimensional box, wage share, employment rate, debt ratio, private debt over GDP. In this fictitious example, the economy starts here, loops, then the debt ratio increases, but fortunately at a certain point it stagnates and then the economy is attracted towards an equilibrium in the long run. The point is that there is no, there is no such thing as a unique equilibrium in contrast with what happens, for instance, the solo model. You have multiple equilibria. This looks like a good equilibrium, but you may have catastrophic equilibria. Okay. Then the big question becomes, in which basin of attraction are we today? Are we you know, in the basin of attraction of a good equilibrium, of a bad equilibrium, etc., etc.? And then this opens the door for a completely new understanding of even public policy. Because public policy now means, once we have understood where we are in the phase space of our dynamical system, how can we drive the economy from one basin of attraction to another, so that the economy, the forces of the economy, will drive the economy towards a desirable equilibrium in the long run. You see my point? And how can you drive it? With taxations, subventions, subsidies, the usual toolkit of public policy. You get it? Now, what is the impact of climate change? So we have studied it, coupled this kind of dynamical system with a climate model, Today we are using I Love Klim. I Love Klim is a medium-sized climate model which provides you with information every 50 kilometers on Earth. So there is a high granularity, so you can know what will be the rainfall in the village of your mom, for instance, uh, if you study I Love Klim, which is a very important information for you, I'm sure. Um, and so why, by coupling this climate model with the macroeconomic model, we end up with the following conclusion, which is that the world economy, absent any global warming, would be on the path of a not too bad long-run equilibrium. So this is definitely not a Marxist viewpoint, which would tell you, you know, capitalism is, is going to self-destroy itself, etc., etc. This model does not tell you this. It tells you, well, if there was no global warming, we it would not be so bad. It's not good, but it's not catastrophic. But global warming is pulling the economy out of the basin of attraction of this long-run equilibrium, 
and driving the economy towards the basis of attraction of a catastrophic equilibrium, where there is no employment, an infinite amount of debt, no wages, etc. Big collapse at the world level. And more precisely, uh, we end up with a conclusion that the business as usual scenario would lead us to a global collapse of the world economy before the end of the century. So we should not, you know, trust too much these models. I'm not telling you that I have my crystal ball and that I can tell you that we are going to have a collapse in 2075, you know. That's impossible to tell. But it definitely it says something like Meadows was not completely wrong even though there was no climate change in Meadows' work. But once you, have climate once you add climate change into the picture, unfortunately, you end up with the same conclusion. This business as usual scenario leads to a catastrophic uh, end of the story before the end of this century. You get it? Now, what we have done as well using this kind of tool is that we have added a number of very important things like endogenous growth. So that's essentially what we call the Caldor Verdon hypothesis. Mm. We have added <coughs> increasing returns to scale. We have also added a multi-sectoral version which deals with the Cambridge controversy. I'm sure you have heard something about the Cambridge controversy. <coughs> so you know that there is no such thing as capital. Capital does not exist. What exists is a number of infrastructures, building this house, infrastructures, utilities which provide you with power, electricity, uh, there is also financial capital, but that's completely different. So actually, you have <coughs> a multi-scale, <coughs> multivariate definition of capital, as it was advocated by Cambridge UK. And they were right, as you know, and they have won the intellectual battle, as you know, as was acknowledged by Paul Samuelson, contrary to what you would read in any textbook, including in, in Piketty's book about capital, yes. where he explicitly writes that Cambridge US was right, which is not true, and he knows it. Uh, so Cambridge UK was right. So the unique way to deal with capital in, in, a, in a way that makes sense is to allow for various sectors in the economy. And not just, you know, agriculture industry services, but it's much more complicated than that. So we have done this, and we have now a full-fledged multi-sectoral dynamical system where you can study all these questions. And for instance, you can see the impact of a growing inflation in the energy sector and how this contaminates the entire economy as it is doing today with the inflation that we are experiencing. We also have added money in the model, and you know that there is a lot of controversies about money. So the viewpoint defended here, which is it's just the empirical truth, is that money is non-neutral, as you know. It's not true that multiplying by two, the quantity of, of money circulating in the economy has no impact, but only the multiplication by two of the level of prices. This is, there is an abundant empirical literature on this, showing that money is never neutral, just never. So forget everything about money neutrality, okay? And if you are not sure, just read, please, the beautiful papers written by Werner, I don't remember his first name, who is the guy working in the UK, fantastic guy, you know? He has written like three, four papers showing, advocating again, money is non-neutral, and second point, money is endogenous. What does it mean? It's not true that the quantity of money circulating in the economy is just given by the quantity of money printed by the central bank. There is no such thing as a money multiplier. It does simply does not exist. One example which proves this is what happened in 2009, where maybe you know that M0, so the quantity of money printed by the central bank, was larger than M1, the first, the lower, the smallest monetary aggregate that you can find for the money circulating into an economy in the United States because of the subprime crisis. Why? Just because the central bank was printing billions, trillions of dollars for the banks, the banks were not using this money to put it into the real economy. So they were keeping the money because they were afraid to be bankrupt, and M0 became larger than M1, which if you believe in the money multiplier would mean that the money multiplier is lower than one, yeah. which doesn't make, sen doesn't make any sense for neoclassical economists. So mon the money multiplier simply does not exist. Why? Because a bank, to create a credit, so to create money, needs a customer who wants to borrow money. That's the endogeneity of money. Then the, and maybe you have seen that the Diamond Deepvik Ben Bernanke 
Nobel Award has been, has been given this year to all these people who completely deny this. Mm. So they think that banks are not banks. Banks don't create money. And money is neutral. So money can be just ignored because it's a veil, as uh, Jean-Baptiste Say would say. So we, d we don't do that. And we have a, a rewriting of the model in such a way that you can see how the banking system creates money. Money is endogenous and money is non-neutral. And so with using this kind of family of models, we offer this as a toolkit for public policy decisions, both for governments. So now we have a contract with the South African government, and we are going to build a South African version of the model for the South African National Treasury uh, in Pretoria, but also for Europe, for a, a company like Deloitte. You know, I know, I know, it's not the devil. We are working also for Deloitte, but be because Deloitte has understood that its clients need this information in order to deal with Europe. And hopefully we will also uh, work with this kind of toolkit for a number of other governments. governments. Does this make sense to everybody? So I'm done. Now the floor is yours for questions. <laughs>